My very dear, dear friends, this is uh, August 1st, 2022. We are on the second day of our crossing to the Northern Sailor Ridge, talking about the skillful means of Paravija. It is uh, a great pleasure of mine to introduce Cornelia Bielke to uh, who we are speaking today. She's speaking on generosity, and I think that she has uh, definitely done that path a lot, and we can see that in her life. Uh, she was ordained, uh, I think it was last year, uh, during the pandemic, for sure, we had a wonderful little pandemic kind of ordination at the Mindfulness Center. Um, and uh, her name is True Continuation of Skillfulness. Wow. So with that, with, with that name, of course, we certainly are going to have, we're certainly going to have a wonderful talk with that. And so uh, I'm going to pin her to this so that she takes up the screen. Oh, why can't I pin you? Mm -hmm. Really, I'm having a hard time getting you. Maybe I can just put you on speaker view. It'll work the same way. All right. So uh, without further ado, here is Cornelia. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. I seem to hear you, yeah. Okay, excellent. That's I'm just thinking they can't see you. So yeah. You can't see them, so yeah. That's important that you can hear me. I My biggest fear was I could, that I would- Cornelia, <laughs> They said it could be a little louder. I don't know if that's a little like louder. That. Okay, let yeah. me just turn this up some more. I have your speaker here. How is that? Is that better? Yes. 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 Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Well, my biggest fear was that I would forget to unmute myself, but I finally learned that. <laughs> so, um. I've been asked to talk about Donna generosity. Uh, the first of the six paramitas. Uh, dear Thai, dear noble Sangha, it's wonderful to see you there in this beautiful hall. And uh, I hope that you're all having a, a beautiful retreat and beautiful weather there. Um, I would like to begin with a guided meditation. Um, it's part of my daily meditating routine, actually, and uh, I think it's a meditation, it's four phrases that uh, promote generosity in me when I remember to do this. So, please sit comfortably. Today, I vow to offer joy to one person in the morning. Today, I vow to help relieve the suffering of one person in the afternoon. Today, I vow to look at all beings with the eyes of understanding and love.
today, I vow to practice joy on the path of service. In the last two years, you and I and so many have lived through ups and downs and have experienced great losses. We've had to mourn the passing of our beloved teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. We've lost 6.34 million human beings worldwide and more than 1 million in this country here to the COVID pandemic. We continue to suffer with those who have lost children, friends, mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters through the continued violence and carnage that plagues this country. It is impossible to turn away from the abuses of power, revoking women's rights to determine their own destination, and the effects of injustice and poverty. We live with the disasters of climate change and wars, and we struggle with our own demons. All of this is interbeing. When I think of interbeing, I tend to think of how wonderful it is. I think about nature, I think about how the little birds out there pick the insects off of my vegetable plants and so forth. Uh, and I think of all the wonderful things of interbeing, but of course there's the other side of interbeing that we're all familiar with. It's the suffering. And we do suffer. The Buddha taught us that there's a way to alleviate suffering. And he proposed the beautiful Eightfold Path. This path contains and connects the <coughs> all the Buddhist practices, including, bless you, the six paramitas. All the teachings are interwoven and inseparable. They also inter are. One contains all, and all is contained in one. So when I think about dana, generosity, I'm also thinking about compassion and equanimity loving kindness, gratitude, and all those qualities and lessons from not only the Buddhist teachings, but all religious teachings. Mindfulness, Buddhist practice, our continuing quest to relieve our own suffering, and that the suffering of others brings you here. And it is the intention of a retreat to support and guide each other in the journey and to find new ways to practice and flow together like a river. Practicing loving kindness and deep listening, you will be planting new seeds and new seeds will be planted in you. You will water the seeds of healing and joy in each other. That's all wonderful. Or, well, maybe not. In all this wonderful togetherness, you will also experience challenges. There are things you won't like. There will be discussions that may rub you the wrong way. There will be a, an annoying person for sure somewhere. <laughs> and uh, there's that food line. So look at all of those things with compassion and with generosity. That's your first act of generosity right where you are. Generosity is also called the flower of interbeing. 
the Buddha is credited with these words. If you know, as I do, the power of giving, you would not let a single meal pass without sharing some of it. I really love this because I love cooking for other people and I love sharing meals. So this, this statement really hit home with me. Every act of generosity, however big or small, intended or sometimes even unintended, plants the seeds that can prompt more generosity. Our survival and existence is the result of generosity, if you think of it. We're sustained by Mother Earth and all it contains. There's a lot of generosity at work. Let's reflect on some acts of generosity that affect you and me right here in this moment. Think of the Buddha who left his comfortable life and home where he had everything. He set out to find a way to alleviate suffering after he got to know suffering. Trying to find a way to give up all attachments. And he did not stop until he found a path that he could teach us. This is why we are all here. Think of the monks and teachers who walked across the Himalayas, traveled across continents to spread the wealth of the Buddhist teachings. If they hadn't, we may not know anything about all this wisdom. We would not sit where we are sitting here today. Those are some powerful seeds planted by very generous human beings. Think about Thich Nhat Hanh, our root teacher, who led a life of sacrifice, incredible generosity and dedication. His generosity and selfless efforts helped so many people in war, in peace, on rafts, and in monasteries. His generosity brings us together in this present moment, you at the Pristine Center and me here on the screen. It was his realization that it was not enough to lead a monastic life devoid of engagement with suffering of his people. He needed to engage with his people. It made him leave the comfort of the monastery. And by the way, this generosity went much against the grain and was not appreciated by the monastics at the time. Sometimes generosity involves a fight. Think about the Christine Center. It exists because of the sisters whose vision and foresight found this plot of land and decided that this would be a good place of refuge and respite for so many people including us. Generosity continues to fulfill fill this vision for all of us. That's the power of generosity. And following the Buddha's footsteps, we are on the path of a bodhisattva, searching to reduce suffering in the world through self-reflection, study, and practice. You and I we yearn to increase love, compassion, joy, and equanimity in ourselves and in the world around us. You are being generous. Generosity also allows you to be there for this week, perhaps because there are people who support you, who take care of your home, care for your children or your pets, or water your garden while you're gone. Supporting your practice, they are being generous. And last not least, one more example of great generosity. We're all there. I'm here, you're there, because of our wonderful Bodhisattva and loving teacher, Paul Norton. Many of us know him and his dedication so well. I think he's a living example of someone who embodies generosity. 
He has planted seeds in so many of us. And I can truly speak for myself on that. Seeds that continue to bear fruit and multiply in our ever-growing Sangha. I say this with a deep bow of gratitude. Our practice is possible because of the many different forms of generosity of others, but also because we ourselves are offering generosity. <coughs> sharing is generosity, not just material sharing, but the sharing of our lives, Dharma lessons, time and hearts. And that includes the sharing of silence. The practice of noble silence, the sharing of silence is an act of deep generosity. Noble silence is a big part of Buddhist retreats. We need noble silence so that we are able to do the work within ourselves, calm our busy chatty minds and renew our diligence and concentration away from a world of distractions. Practicing noble silence is expected in Buddhist retreats. It is, an import, is as important as meditation. In fact, I would say it is meditation. The fact that we may experience resistance to the idea of being quiet makes it very clear that it is a challenge. Resisting impulses and strong habit energy is part of the practice. So, if you're challenged by this effort, double your effort. I know it is difficult. I like to talk. Retreats are supposed to be challenging, but know that you are supposed that you are supported by your sangha. Together you will water the good seeds in each other and plant new ones. So please take the challenge of noble silence as a practice of generosity toward one another. Flow as a river, as our noble teacher Tai would say. So now I would like to take a moment for all of us to reflect in silence, to think about an act of generosity that has deeply affected and impacted your life. Maybe it was a neighbor, a teacher, a parent, a lover, a child, an employer, whoever it might be. Think about somebody who has been very generous to you and made a big difference in your life. And as you reflect on this, I would encourage you to pay attention to the effect this memory has on your emotions, as well as how you might feel that memory in your body. Notice if feelings of gratitude and light wash over you. Reflect on the memory this person has created in you.
So the six paramitas or perfections are described as noble character qualities of enlightened beings. There are a number of different translations of the word paramiti, which I will not endeavor to go into because I'm not a scholarly person. But uh, I picked through a few of those and cherry picked a little bit on a Tibetan uh, reading, uh, which translates it as that which goes beyond or transcends uh, that which brings us to the other shore. Going to the other shore is the work of a bodhisattva, and living according to the paramitas is supposed to make that possible. The six paramitas are generosity, morality or ethical conduct, patience or tolerance, diligence or effort, concentration or also contemplation, and wisdom, insight. I'm sure we'll all learn a lot more about the meaning of each of these in the coming days. And as an aside, there are also the 10 paramitas and the 12 paramitas. Uh, thankfully, they're mostly for monastics to follow, although probably some of you would love an excuse to spend 12 days at the Christine Center. <laughs> but we will focus on six, uh, and I will focus on one. It's very interesting to me that in our Western way of Buddhist practice and mindfulness practice, uh, whether it's Buddhist or secular, it seems that the initial focus when we begin is very much on meditation and personal transformation. And then that sort of prompts uh, morality, generosity, and so forth. Uh, but the sequence of the paramitas tells a different story to me. Generosity is number one. It's the gateway to the other five. And it seems to me that might actually be a very easy starting point uh, for the way to understand interbeing and non-self. It makes sense to me. So. Uh, if you find meditation very difficult and it's hard to focus, but you could think of dana or generosity and perhaps uh, some very generous action, well, small, big or small one, uh, you might find a way into seeing uh, interbeing. You might find an easy access to non-self. So, I like this idea. The Buddha is credited with saying that without a generous heart, no true spiritual life is possible. Generosity is the ornament of the world. Through generosity, one turns back from the lower realms. It is the stairway to the higher realms. Tai said that generosity is a virtue that produces peace. Now, there are many ways to practice dana and different ways of looking at it. And I made a list of five. Uh, and as we know, with the Buddha's teachings, they are, of course, all interwoven. When you give of material things, you're, of course, also giving of your time because you have to acquire the material things and so forth. So uh, the first one is material generosity. That's an easy one to understand because well, you take something and you can give it to somebody, very easy to get. Depending on the level of practice, this can also involve renunciation. But it can be the dollar passed to a homeless person on the street or giving something that you no longer need. It can also involve an investigation of how much I have and what it is I really need. Do I share enough with people and organizations that work to alleviate suffering? Where is my resistance to sharing my material wealth? 
Those are all thoughts that go into this group of material generosity. And I know that some of you are probably at the stage in life where I am. Uh, I have become very generous. I have uh, been working on really reducing my possessions and I've gone through my house many times and thought, how did this ever get here? Why do I have this? We all have this. So, and there's always somebody who actually needs it or maybe not. And then there's the dumpster. But uh, there are so many ways for material wealth to share, which can be a great relief to those who really need things. Um, and I would like to share an experience on this topic that I had a couple weeks ago on a very hot Sunday afternoon in Wawajosa, where I live. I was participating in a rally for women's reproductive rights. And at the meeting place in Hart Park, I met a young man by the name of Badger Van Gray. He was there with a van that was filled with wooden sticks, tools, uh, boards for signs, colored markers, first aid supplies, and coolers filled with ice cold water. And as he was stapling my poster for me, uh, which also had been supplied by another generous person, I commented on his efficiency and preparedness. And he told me that this was his 378th protest and that he had been to protest from pipelines to Black Lives Matter to all sorts of events, taking care of people. At the halfway point of our march, he was already there with coolers set out with water again for all of us who were getting kind of parched in this heat. When I asked him how I can make a donation, because he prompted me to want to be generous. He said I could find him on Facebook. I did. It made me feel deep gratitude and it prompted me to be generous too. This is how generosity works. For him, it was a way of serving and helping and being generous on this hot afternoon. Of course, he also gave his time, and this brings me to number two, the giving of time. Many of us are involved with various groups, whether it's for local justice, with Buddhist peace fellowship, environmental causes, in and outside of Buddhist circles, protecting animals, plants, and minerals in the earth holder sangha, or cooking a meal for a shut-in person. All of this is the gift of time. Some of to visit prisons to teach the Dharma. And even the time that you spend meditating is an act of generosity. I find that time is a sort of a finite resource for us with our lives, but we can stretch time so much by planting seeds and good memories that continue well into the future. We all give that time. The third one is offering protection, protecting the life and safety of others, offering shelter, offering a place in our homes, perhaps, helping refugees and immigrants, protecting the rights of women, or even just making someone feel safe in a safe place to talk. I speak from experience. About 30 years ago, I was no longer safe in my home, and I had to leave very quickly. I had a friend who offered me a safe place to stay until things got sorted out. There and then, I promised myself that I would do the same if I ever encountered someone in a situation like this. And believe it or not, it happened. I'm not sure I would have acted the same way if I had not experienced my wonderful friend Heidi's generosity. Generosity promotes generosity. The fourth one I found 
important to share with you is that we all share the Dharma. Sharing the Dharma can be formal, such as when we sit, uh, sit uh, starting a meditation group at a center or sharing meditation in neighborhoods, in a prison, in a fitness center, or trying to teach children about meditation, purchasing books for inmates about the Dharma. And we also share the generosity and the Dharma by the way we live our everyday lives. The fifth one is kindness. Sometimes it is the simple kindness of smiling at a stranger, seeing someone who's having a hard time, thanking, saying words of appreciation to the checkout person in the shop, or just being in the moment. Kindness is an infinite resource. I feel that it grows. The more we give, the greater our ability to practice kindness slash generosity becomes. Kindness promotes peace. Kindness moves us to look past ourselves and see how we inter are. The last one I want to mention is generosity toward ourselves. Do you know how to be generous with yourself? I'm not thinking about indulgence, that new pair of shoes or that chocolate bar. I'm thinking of how we treat ourselves in our minds. We spend a great deal of our lives which are inherently unsatisfactory, we learned that, uh, playing in our minds this uh, intimate battle. Somebody I read said, don't turn your mind into a battleground. Well, I don't know anybody who hasn't done that. We spend so much time feeling unworthy, never good enough, not deserving of others' love, trust, our own trust in ourselves, whatever qualities it is we think up at that moment. The lack of generosity towards ourselves is a source of great suffering, and we impart that onto the people around us. So it's the more important to address that, because we tend to treat others the way we treat ourselves. I like Sharon Salzberg very much, and in her book, Loving Kindness, she says, generosity's aim is twofold. We give to free others, and we give to free ourselves. Somebody is on here who is not muted, and we hear some kitchen noises. It would be very nice if that person could be generous and mute. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, where was I? So generosity's aim is twofold. We give to free others and we give to free ourselves. Without both aspects, the experience is incomplete. If we give a gift freely, without attachment to a certain result or expectation of what will come back to us, that exchange celebrates freedom, both within ourselves as the giver and the receiver. End of quote. Generosity is an antidote to living with greed and selfishness. It is liberation from attachments, from the need to control and to possess. Every act of generosity is another step toward freedom from the delusion of self, of the independent self. The acknowledgement of my own inherent goodness is as important as the appreciation of others. Ties words again. Generosity is a virtue that produces peace. I'd like to offer you another moment for reflection. In the earlier reflection, we thought about the generosity of others and how it had affected us. And this time, I would like you to think of a time 
when you did something generous for someone, some something that was very important, mm -hmm. something that was unexpected, something that helped that person a great deal. What effect has it had on you? Think about how it made you feel and how you feel about it now, just thinking about it. Did you give or do whatever it was purely without reservation or expectation? Would you do it again? What other things might come up in connection with that event? Let's take a moment for that. Before I come to the end of my talk, I would like to make one more point, and that is, how is dana connecting with the dharma? And how is dharma connecting with us through generosity? So I'm thinking about the dharma in three parts. The first is that dharma means to see the truth, seeing things as they truly are, the reality of what is. The Dharma, like all things, is always changing and impermanent. That's very important. Second, the Dharma is seen as the teachings of the Buddha. At the core of the teachings are impermanence, meaning that everything is constantly changing and nothing is static and non-self meaning that all that exists is made up of elements of everything else. And the third way of thinking of the Dharma is, the Dharma is everything. It's you, it's me, it's the teacup, the dog, the table, everything is a Dharma. We and everything that is, inside and out, is Dharma. We're living in it, we are it, we are moved by it. So when we study the Dharma and practice things like generosity, we are affecting the Dharma. When we receive and give, we can clearly see interdependence, the interbeing of our existence with everything that is. We are changing the Dharma and the Dharma is changing because of us. Think about how wonderful this realization is, how powerful, how much hope for you and me there is, because we have the capacity to learn, to practice, and to change not only our lives, but in doing so, we can change the course of everything around us, the life of everything that is. Sometimes that seems like a very small thing. And it's, it can be discouraging. We would like to change the world and we think we can't, or maybe our actions, our generosity 
is so small, it doesn't make much of a difference. But that is not true, because we all flow together as a river. It matters what you do, all of it, everything. And it matters what I do. Dana has the power to change not only you and me, but the world, even in far away places and in days that we won't even see anymore. So it gives me a great deal of hope when I see all of you. Uh, you continue to give me faith in this practice and I'm filled with gratitude for everyone there at the Christine Center. Thank you, Cornelia. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if we had any people here in the center or maybe online there that would also like to maybe have a make a comment or a question. And let me see if I can get this out of so I can see everybody on online. So there are are there is there anyone who has a question or a comment? I have a microphone here. People. Thank you, Cornelia. It was just beautiful. And I've never contemplated so many aspects of generosity <laughs> until, until uh, benefiting from your Dharma talk. And my comment is you've also helped me um, get clear about um, wanting to be aware of my intention behind what might be a generous gesture and in a way that um, having a real uh, desire to um, to give and let go um, perhaps more than I have and I want to so I just want to thank you so much um, Thank you for your comment. Thank you very much. I love the way that you broke this down. Sometimes you think that you really we just kind of limit ourselves maybe to the first one. The example. I'm sorry, I have a, a really hard time understanding the words. Also, oh, there you hear me now. Uh, yeah, that's maybe better. Um, okay. Uh, again, thanks uh, for bringing this down into a lot of different ways of viewing. Sometimes we only think of mostly the material thing, I think. Um, as Tony just alluded to, uh, as you were talking, it, it occurred to me uh, that um, the letting go part, I think, is a huge part of generosity. Uh, so often we get so attached to our views and we try to hold, you know, convince others of things and uh, not want to. Look at all the people's uh, viewpoints and so forth. So I think we need uh, letting go is a really, really important form of giving also to impair a lot of things. Thank you. That's really true. And uh, as I was, uh, as when I decided to put uh, these two reflections on receiving, but also on, on giving generosity that I'm sure everybody has practiced thousands of times in all sorts of ways during their lives, is that, um, well, for myself, um, I'm very grateful uh, when I receive something 
but I oftentimes deny myself uh, the thought about good things that I've done. I can tend to overlook that. And I think we can easily cheat ourselves a little bit out of that. And I think some of this, as I thought about it, came from my Lutheran upbringing that when you did something good for somebody, you, you do it, you know, in secret and quietly, you don't mention it. You don't think much about it because you will lose your reward in heaven. And that sat very deep with me from my childhood. I always thought of that, that you wouldn't say anything or, but that also involved that you don't give yourself credit for your own goodness. And I think that can be a mistake not to brag about your own generosity, but acknowledge it to yourself that, yeah, that was really a good thing I did. This was really something that helped. So give yourself some credit. And I hope that maybe you can build a little bit in your discussion groups on that. Tell each other about your generosity. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you know, you know, if you just address what I wanted to discuss, which was uh, when you asked the first question, I had no difficulty finding acts of generosity that I received. But when you asked what not about this for my own generosity, I felt all of it was tainted. You know, it's, it's all selfish. It's all, there's a, there's a, there's a taste for all of it. And I, I, you know, it showed up. I have a very hard time hearing it. I just get a very muffled sound, so I don't know what you're saying. I'm sorry. You use the mic on the computer, it'll work a little better. So. Okay, yes, that's I can hear that much better. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my uh, comment here is uh, this is Jim Darwin. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I appreciated the other last thing you said. It sort of talked about all the other things to address, which is that when you ask us to explore others' generosity towards ourselves, it's very easy to be to almost be flooded with a series of, of generosity that I receive. When you asked for me to look at my own generosity, I thought that all of it was tainted in some way. All of it involved some kind of selfishness or some kind of fear of the moment. I could not find what I felt to be a fear of generosity. So I wanted to ask you about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should we? You have to get really close to the computer, I think, for me to hear it. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's very echoey. Echoey. Okay. Um, I wanted to say thank you for your talk. Like Jen, I felt. My outward generosity was tainted. <laughs> um, and I was touched by you acknowledging the importance of having generosity towards ourselves. Um, I know that's hard for me. I'm guessing it's hard for lots of people. Um, to just say good job to you. Like I feel like truly hidden when I say that. But I think the kind of joy that we feel for other people when they're generous, trying to find that for yourself when you're generous and not overly criticizing yourself. Thank you. Thank 
Any more comments from anybody on the Zoom screen? Nancy. Hello, Cornelia, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, nice to see you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And I guess I just wanna share, um, this is probably not a coincidence, but an experience I had yesterday um, of where I really could see the flow of, of generosity, giving and receiving. Um, Yesterday morning, before I left, I went to collect tea ball to get a pound of coffee for my friend who lives up here. And when I was gonna pay for it, they said, oh, you still have a free pound left for your birthday. And I said, no, I don't, I already got that. <laughs> and they're like, well, you can have it anyway. And I'm like, okay, thank you. <laughs> then I'm sitting in my car getting ready to drive away. And there was this guy outside my passenger window. Um, and it's like 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So not too concerned and asking for money. And I don't often unroll my window and reach into my purse and give someone money. But this time I did because it just felt right. He said he had to feed himself and his younger sister. I have no idea if that's true or not. It doesn't matter. Um, and then, I went to drop off um, the steamer that I did not give away. I sold it um, on Bayview items for sale, but I had dropped the price. And when I got there to deliver it, and I will say my husband was very unhappy that I was delivering it, but it was a very nice day. <laughs> it was fine. Um, this woman actually said, thank you for delivering it. I'm giving you five extra dollars and here's a big bag of basil to take too. And we um, had, a short but really nice conversation about both of our kids being stolen, um, uh, just cleaning out your parents or cleaning out your home after you've gotten all of your stuff from your parents who have died and how that continues. <laughs> um, and then when I was gonna leave town, I drove through Starbucks and I got to the window and she said, it's on me, I'm sorry for the wait. And it was like, no wait at all. And I'm like, Okay, thank you. And I gave her a big tip. So it just felt like, what a flaw. <laughs> so I have to say, I was a little suspicious because after that, um, I, I just, I turned around the corner and I parked and I texted my husband. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> so, so anyway, I think the takeaway for me is um, just to recognize that it's always there and I don't have to be suspicious of it. Nancy Bowie now. Thank you, dear friend. Uh, beautiful, beautiful experience, Nancy. Sometimes the stars align like this. <laughs> and we can make it happen. Thank you. Yes, Stephanie. Hello, Cornelia. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. This is Stephanie Barron. Um, I wanted to say that I'm very excited. I was very excited when you said that meditation is an act of generosity. It's encouraged me to remember that as we fortify an ecosystem, uh, kindness within ourselves and mindfulness within ourselves, we're, act we're actually acting generously towards the world. And that solitude is not a form of indulgence. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Chris. So speak right where Paul is speaking. That's perfect. I'll okay. get right over here, Cornelia. Good. You were awesome. <laughs> um, yes, generosity begets generosity. And I think just from your Dharma talk today, the generosity that is going to be shown here and is blown out into the world is going to be equally awesome. So 
you did a great job. Um, you know, I think of protection and I think of material. And um, I live in an area where there's a lot of homeless people. And interestingly enough, before I retired, my colleagues and I at our institution um, took the theme of homelessness and we went out and experienced it. And the assignment was to go out and do something and come back and share it. And the one, and then we had several homeless people come to us. And one theme came out of that. It wasn't money. It wasn't even taking me in to buy me some food. It was, don't make us invisible. Mm -hmm. Look at us, see us. We are worthy human beings. And when you do that, very interesting. Um, I've tried it many times down there because I do live in a place too where if you start giving money to everyone, every time you walk down the street, they're gonna be, you know, I mean, it, it can be not, it can be dangerous. Um, so I look and I talk to them and the joy that I see in their face is, is greater than anything that could come from money. So um, thank you again. Um, you just, you nailed it. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Comments in the room? Comments from the, our Zoom attendees? Bill. Cornelia, I sense there's a good area here where you're, you can hear. Yes. And others where it's muffled and it's, how's this here? Yes. Is that, is that good? A little bit more back where you just were, a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. About How about here? here? That's about here. <laughs> Courtney, I, I just love your talk. It was very uh, meaningful and moving to me. And I felt a sense that somehow, in a way I can't express, you pulled together so many pieces. And often in Buddhist teachings, probably originated in India, where there's a lot of analytic thinking. Uh, things get separated out. And so we have six parameters and many lists of many attributes and behaviors and things. But um, I really felt a sense in some mysterious way, you would pull this together. And I feel I was very appreciative of your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And you, yes, Anne. By the way, Cornelia, Anne is coming up, and Anne has been is your substitute, is our substitute pyromaniac for this year. Oh, excellent! <laughs> is this a good place to, to speak? Can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to um, address a little bit of what Jim and Cherie were saying about, you know, them discovering maybe uh, different intentions upon doing uh, generous acts and also not acknowledging their own generosity, maybe because of some of that intention, not being pure or being pure. But I think one of the ways you can do that is, is by sort of taking yourself out of it. A generous act, something giving to someone else is always good. You know, it's, we can do better with our, um, with our intention. And I think it's great that the students recognize that there's something there you know, that you can work on. So don't um, discount. Uh, um, you have, now you have moved. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, and maybe you can speak on this because I think Jim asked Cornelia if you could speak on that too, in terms of people's 
maybe not feeling pure about their intentions when they're involved in, in, in acts of generosity. Can you speak a little bit about that? But I just did, I just want to acknowledge uh, Jim and Cherie's, uh, it's good that you're doing uh, acts of generosity. Um, so that, that's always good and keep doing it. <laughs> but if you could, Cornelia, uh, speak a little bit more about that and our intention what's happening inside us perhaps uh, when we're when we're doing things related to generosity. Thank you. Can yeah. you hear me on that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, what can I say? I'm sure we've all done it. We gave somebody something and we were hoping we were going to get something for it. Uh, or we do something uh, for self-aggrandizement. Look how wonderful I am. I'm, I did this for so-and-so and I have to tell everybody about it, that kind of thing. I would say that's not the intention may have been pure, and maybe we did lose our reward in heaven by do that by doing that. <laughs> it's possible, but I think pure intention is, um, as Larry mentioned, is the letting go of the result. And you know, I mentioned that in my talk that that this uh, desire to possess and to control. Um, that kind of ruins the generosity. Does, does that make sense? So, you know, saying, well, I help this person. So, for example, um, helping somebody who is in some kind of recovery, uh, and you think, well, I'm helping this person and I'm doing, giving them everything they need and doing all those things for them and, and they should really be recovering and then they mess up and then you say well I did all of this for you and see what you did you didn't make good use of it you 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 know you didn't reward me with recovering so that kind of thing I mean it's really important to be able to let go um, of the outcome and of the result and just say I did something that I think is helpful. I think I did something that promotes the health of that person. But we don't have control over other people. and We don't have control over their lives and, and the events in their lives. Um, that doesn't mean that one shouldn't, for example, I think it's very important if you if you donate money to an organization, I think it's a really good idea to check how they spend their money. <laughs> so I think there's some wisdom that is part of that, part of generosity. Not attachment, but wisdom. Is it wise to give a six-year-old $10,000 for a birthday? No. Is it generous? No, it might actually be stupid. So, you know, that, you. It's something one has to weigh, but is, is it, am I doing something to control that person or to possess uh, something in return, then it's not pure. I think, I think that's pretty easy to understand. So check your motivation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Dottie. Good morning, everybody. Dottie bowing in. Uh, it, uh, your wonderful talk, uh, Cornelia, brings to mind um, such gratitude I have for teachers. Um, if, personally, uh, do you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Uh, a, a big thank you to teachers, uh, some who have taught me for years gratis. Uh, professionally, uh, those people, other people I've known, um, and uh, 
teachers that I've paid um, professionally, uh, who helped me professionally. I'm thinking of one, my violin teacher, um, whom I paid over many years, but who gave me of herself. Um, that was such a lesson, almost more than she taught me about the violin. Thank you, everybody. And the Sangha. <laughs> Thanks, Sonny. Yeah, that's really true. Uh, I too have had those experiences of teachers who, uh, one particular teacher who taught me when nobody was allowed to teach me anymore. <laughs> but that's another story. But here's another thing, and you may encounter this, uh, when you do something generous, there are people who cannot accept generosity. And there are people who will instantly conclude that you want something in return. Mm -hmm. And that can be very difficult. And uh, But the difficulty is really on their side. And I mean, for ourselves too, we have to we have to know how to be grateful. Gratitude would have been a whole other Dharma talk about how dar how gratitude works for us. And of course, generosity and gratitude that's like two sisters, you know, this goes along with it. Because if you can't practice gratitude, you probably are also unlikely to recognize generosity. So it's one of those, this is Buddhism and this is life and you know everything is so interdependent and interconnected. It's difficult to tease it apart. I mean, generosity and compassion, same thing. Or generosity and equanimity. It's all one thing. So um, the more we can learn about all of those things and the more we can recognize that it turns into all one big glob that just keeps rolling. It's the wheel of the Dharma. Uh, it's those prayer, I'm thinking about those prayer uh, wheels that the Tibetans use when I think about the Dharma and all its parts. You know, it's something that just keeps, just keeps rolling along. So uh, it's connected and practicing gratitude is it's just another part of it and a very healing part, I would say. I'm sure some of you have had that experience where somebody said, oh, make a gratitude list. And it's in that gratitude that we recognize generosity. So it's all one and one is all. Thanks, Karen. Other comments? Well, I want to thank you, Cornelia, very deeply uh, for your generosity in so skillfully you expounding. You are the true continuation of skillfulness. <laughs> so that's very nice to, to see. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I will remember a lot of things about this talk, but I'm going to remember that that the Dharma is all one big blob. I, I really like that. I really like that concept. You know, it's just there it is. Interbeing. It's all one blob. So thank you very, very deeply for this. And we will, and for those who are not that familiar with Cornelia, she is our music meister. And is uh, we have these wonderful chants that we're getting up from Plum Village in the morning and evening chant, but she usually does them. So uh, when we're listening to the music, or singing, which we should be, which some of us will be doing very shortly. Uh, you know, maybe think of Cornelia and and uh, you know, in in our generosity for her her wonderful activity today. Thank you. And I, so, I thank you all, and I wish you a wonderful silent retreat. <laughs> so we're going to stop the recording now.